Hello, dear friends. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Ildar Kananov. Uh, and I would like to welcome you back to our series of lectures dedicated to music theory. Last lecture was uh, introductory. Uh, I went through several aspects of music theory as a discipline. And today uh, I would like to focus a little bit more on what is called oral skills or ear training. Of course, um, this discipline is ubiquitous. It, it, it's, it's used it's used by musicians uh, all over the world, and in different countries, this discipline has different names. But for example, um, in Russia, and uh, every musician carries his or her training in this area. It's very specific. It's like binary code um, or operational system. Uh, we operate under certain systems. Um, so I uh, studied self edge in ear training in uh, Russia. I just a slip of my tongue. I, I call it self edge. So self is an official title of this discipline in Russia, in Russian tradition. Uh, it comes from French, of course, and uh, there is a, a profound connection between uh, French and Russian and Soviet methods of teaching ear training and oral skills. This discipline is ultimately important for anybody who would like to become a professional musician. It's probably the most problematic discipline today, among other among, among, among all other disciplines of music theory. It's also a part of a larger problem. It's, it's part of a, a systematic thinking uh, on, the le on the scale of nation, on the scale of national tradition, national tradition. It's, it's, not, it's not a problem for one student and one teacher to solve. Paradoxically, in 1918, when uh, Russia was on its knees, is the metaphor to, to be on, on, on its knees, it was completely destroyed. Everything was in disarray, economy, politics. And in, in, in the cold days of winter of 1918, Bolsheviks, we call them Bolsheviks, but although um, Comrade Lunacharsky was, was not, not your typical Bolshevik. So he and uh, so many others, uh, uh, people from previous era joined the effort. Uh, brother and sisters, Gnesin, for example. They have created a system, a network of schools of music, the so-called children's music schools, and um, pre-college, -pre pre-conservatory colleges, so-called uchilishi. So it's a um, seven-year cycle of children's music school, and then four-year uchilishi. Altogether, eleven, and not, not only that, the, the, the instruction would begin to students at the age of four or five. And I already mentioned that that, that, that they, they would accept uh, children for violin uh, at the age of four. So six would, would be already too late. But um, the first year, a child would not be uh, taught an instrument. 
whole year would be given for general musical education, so-called general musical education, which included ear training, which is called solfege, solfeggio, participation in choir. Um, perhaps in some schools it was uh, a class in musical literature or, or just a, a discussion of music in general. And this way, very systematically, thoroughly, a child would be exposed, would be exposed to musical notation, musical grammar. Approximately at the same time, uh, uh, there would be uh, a teacher of elementary music theory, elementarne teoria musica. So there would be a separate short class meeting weekly. As far as ear training or solfege, twice a week, uh, regularly, two semesters in a year. And you can imagine uh, a Russian trained musician would receive ear training classes, lessons or classes. In some cases, uh, there were very few students in the classroom, so it's like uh, somewhere between uh, individual instruction and, and classroom instruction. Um, since the age of five or six, so it's two years, approximately two years before a child would, would go into high school. So imagine uh, some ten years in, in the high school, in the, in, in the period that is covered by high school, elementary, middle, and high school. That's it. So, okay. um, and two years before, and one year definitely at the conservatory. Now. And uh, we teach in the United States and in, in Europe, uh, in Western Europe, we teach ear training to incoming students, to freshmen and sophomore, and that's from the eat. Uh, and and uh, as far as the years that precede this, this age group, um, nobody is sure what is going on, what's happening. And as a professor of music theory, as assistant professor of music theory, at the conservatory, uh, I cannot assume that an incoming student uh, has already had training in solfege and oral skills. I already mentioned uh, Boris Teplov's uh, study, the Psychology of Musical Talent, in which he maintains that melodic hearing is developing in children from a very early age, let's say from four or five, mm. until the age of eight or nine. It actually varies in different places and the, the, the different teachers are slightly different approaches, approach to uh, the age limits, but that's how melodic hearing developed. During this period, it is crucial to give students the uh, significant training in musical tone, holding a tone with a tone with your voice. It's always, it's always, for some students it's difficult to hold a tone, hold the pitch. Um, scales, scales, uh, uh, the tones of the scale, um, intervals. I would say that the uh, first six, five or six years in a children's school, plus two years before that, were, were dedicated solely to conquering the system of keys, the circle of fifth. And I have some textbooks which are normally used in were used in Soviet Union. Uh, for example, this is this one is published in 1971. Kalnikov, Fredkin, two part uh, sometimes, and uh, yeah, this this is old. This is one part sometimes. If you look at this, 
the key of G major is introduced after 138 exercises. So there are 138 exercises in C major. It's approximately a semester of singing, or less. So you see how slowly students would sing with solfege syllables and, and two part. It's also moving very slowly, slowly, slowly. So if um, if we consider that the system of notation is, is rather simple, it's it's it's, it's not a calculus uh, tool or anything anything of, of, of that stature, but it's still very it's still very difficult to learn to absorb. Now one thing that makes Russian and French solfege very different from what is accepted in Anglo-Saxon world is um, the, the position of the do. Uh, the system which I grew up in is fixed do. I've heard many, many, many reasonings, uh, discussions, heated debates on advantages of movable do. This is just a preliminary discussion. This is just introductory lecture. I, I cannot explain everything that I went through. I've done, I presented some five or six papers at uh, major international conferences, College Music Society, um, uh, Dutch Flemish Society. So I, I went to some places, presented this. Um, I firmly stand on uh, the necessity to introduce a fixed doll solfege very early, from the age of five or six. This fixed doll solfege, solfege syllables, become a binary code. A student doesn't have anything else. It's the language of music for a student. Um, in the West now, in the United States, we have two systems, pretty much. I mean, it's, 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 this is already very, very complicated. Cognitively speaking, it's, it's impossible. So the students sing in solfege, using solfege syllables, but they orient themselves in music using letter names. So for them, it's G major. Uh, but you can also get this note, G is sol. It's already something unnecessary, very complicated. Uh, Russian and French musicians would say sol major. They would say sol major, sol major, sol major. So do re mi fa sol la ti, do re mi fa sol la si, by the way, not ti, si. Uh, in the course of training for years, I'm talking about 26 semesters of solfege, twice a week. Not two years, not four semesters, 26. I went through 30 semesters of solfege, but I was lucky. Been lucky. So this is one thing. So, so, and uh, our teachers would, 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 get, would get very angry if we would sing and misspell the note. Instead of solo, we would sing la. That would be equal to not knowing the language of music. So this strictly reinforced. One other disadvantage of movable dos of edge, uh, inborn disadvantage, is, is its origin. It's the origins of these two systems uh, different, are very different. Fixed dos of edge was introduced in Italy and France, especially at the conservatory, the very beginning of Paris conservatory, the very end of the 18th century, uh, for a purpose. It was training for orchestral musicians who perform large-scale compositions. Even even a march, we know that the French conservatory started as school for marching bands. But but even there, but but very quickly it has become uh, a professional school for training of, of orchestral musicians. So if if a student has to play, let's say, a violin part in the symphony he or she should be able to operate with all 
keys in the system of tonality. By the way, the French and the Russians are very specific about this. Tonality is not seven notes. Diatonic tonality is actually non nonsense. Tonality is a system of keys. A flat major is the part of C major. It's, it's, it's organic part of C major. It should be seen on the same radar, on the same map. If you drag the scale from C to from C to A flat and call A flat C, then it means that you don't see these two keys as a part of tonality. And movable door was, was just compromise. It was introduced uh, with the purpose of facilitating uh, uh, church singing in, in, in England. I work in church. I know that church choirs are mostly comprised of amateur musicians. But they're not even so many of them don't even know how to read notes. So if a hymn is written in G, G sharp minor, it's easy to call the G sharp do. That that makes it easy. So it's it's the, it's the way to avoid the system of modulations, digressions, the system that we actually teach in in classes in harmony and counterpoint form. Therefore. And I've talked to uh, Professor Schachter, Dr. Schachter, a very important theorist, and he told me that he considers um, the French and Russian system, the fixed door system, more, more fundamental, more important. And by the way, it, it matches Schenkerian idea. In, in Schenker, uh, there's, there, there's no way that you can drag tonic from, from tonic note to some other note. All the secondary key areas are attached to the main trunk, which is um, and, and that's what fixed do works very well. So there's a contradiction. If we teach Schenker, we should teach fixed do and not move. Now, um, of course, uh, uh, the system and the variety of applications, solfege in, solfege in, in Russia is amazing. Um, there's some collections based on folk music. Hostenko, for example, solfege of Hostenko. It makes sense. One thing which I miss in contemporary pedagogy is, is, is a complete modernist detachment from a folk popular tradition. It's all highbrow, Viennese, classical, uh, which is, by the way, placed under harsh critique today, and I, I completely agree with that. In order to learn music, you, you, you can't just sit and, and start memorizing note head positions or, or intervals. It should come from your heritage. That's why all systems of solfege which are successful, French, Italian, Russian, Hungarian, so Hungarian, very powerful tradition. Cuban, maybe, I don't know, I, I'm not aware. Venezuela, 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 El Sistema. They're all relate initial material to children's song. Oh, I remember singing about Little Bunny, about how um, Ivan is smart. Why is he so smart? Some of these songs entered the rep repertory of, of classical music. Tchaikovsky uses them all over the place. So this is one other mm, suggestion. Of course, if you, if you practice very hard for so many years in, in ear training, you can get very far with it. This is classical standard collection. Rubets, Alexander Rubets, is contemporary of Tchaikovsky. In Russia, and especially in the Soviet Union, he's been accused of plagiarism. Of course, he, he took so many exercises from French books, without mentioning it. It's, that's, that's not very good, of course. But this is French system, and these are exercises that are required from students to sight read. Upon request, without preparation. So, uh, if someone wants to enter Moscow Conservatory as a student, he or she had to do something like exercise 146, which covers 
almost two pages. And it's just probably a, a violent part from uh, some symphonic composition. It, it has everything. It's very difficult. It's incomparable in, com in, in, in level with what we do today. And why do we have to compromise for the sake of which ideas, which innovations we, we have to abandon this magnificent system, uh, Dannhäuser, Lavignac, these are... And now we, we stop using them. It's very difficult. Well, um, uh, there's a jazz solfege, very interesting jazz solfege. I've used this in, in classes at everybody, which is very interesting to, to solfegeize in jazz. Of course, there's um, Marina Karasova, one of my colleagues from Moscow Conservatory. It's just, we studied with Yuri Holopov together. She studied with him, and I studied with him. This is contemporary solfege. But this is it's, it's impossible. It's almost impossible to sing because it's very, very complex. Very, very complex. Atonal solfege, chromatic solfege. Magnificent. Um, for, look at these clusters. Um, polymodal voice reading. Um, the rhythm outside of measure, um, octatonic here, octatonic solfege here is polyharmony, chromatic tonality. So these exercises have to be done with conducting necessarily. No solfege singing can be acceptable without conducting. Here's a question about rhythm. We have so many textbooks in rhythm. You cannot train musical rhythm outside of music. And that's the premonition of uh, Russian solfege teachers. And they, they, they say, oh, well, well, old teachers in Russia used to say that you cannot teach rhythm. Pitch is possible to teach. But rhythm is, is the sense. It's the sense of rhythm. However, you can wake it up, but it has to be done Always with pitch, never as a separate exercise when you, when you hit something. This is not, however, the only thing that you should do in, in a lesson in solfege. Very fast sequences of intervals. That's what it ends in. You, you, play, you play several intervals in a row, outside of the key, inside key, outside the key. Very important exercise is uh, identification of chord, chord progression. Here, the Russian and Soviet system relies heavily upon tonal functional system. And that is another problem that we have created for ourselves out of, out of nothing. Yes, Schenker criticized Ramo Riemann for their understanding of harmony as mere verticalities. But this is not true. Function, tonal harmonic function, is not the same. It's not the same entity as a chord. A chord has function. And the function of the chord is to connect this chord horizontally with other chords. So long before this linear analysis was introduced by Schenker, theorists, well, since, since Ramon, have realized the horizontal flow or synthesis. It was synth it's called syntax. Riemann's dissertation is called musicology, synthesis. That syntax is very complex. It, 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 it's, it, it's a number of versions of a cycle, but you have to hear not a chord, not a single function of a single chord, but series of functions as they cycle and recycle and recycle. Cycles can be incomplete, it can be plagal, authentic. There's so many ways to combine this. But the key to identification of chords in large, long, 
chromatic chord progression is orientation by function. It's not that unusual to see a Russian student who can identify every chord, provide Roman numerals pretty much, with figure based on Every chord, every inversion, to tell, to tell what's happening in every voice in a progression that modulates. It is filled with chromaticism and contains more than 40 or 50 chords. That's the length, that's the depth of hearing. This goal is unfortunately unachievable uh, based on our system and accept methodology. I think we should have to we should have to go back and revise some of these things which were thrown out of the window, thrown with bathwater in, in the harsh 1920s and post World War II period when everybody was trying to revise everything, rewrite everything. Well, of course. Nobody is perfect, and 19th century pedagogy had some deficiencies, but voila, <laughs> this level is un un unachievable today, and I, I really want to see how it can be reinforced. This system, or dictation, includes dictation. Uh, one part dictation is trivial, of course, uh, by the seventh grade of this system, um, monodic dictation would be interesting to write if it's completely atonal, based on some 12 tone idea or something like that. But just to sit and write um, um, a, a melodic dictation, no matter how long it is, would be, be a questionable activity. Since uh, Boris Teplov suggests that um, melodic hearing stops developing at the age of 8 or 9, and then from age of 8 or 9 until age of 14, for example, the harmonic hearing starts developing. That's where you have to really reinforce harmonic progressions, and listen to harmonic progressions, long harmonic progressions, daily. Ask your students to identify first the flow of tonal harmonic functions. That's the first take. And then, if a person, if a student we managed to identify that this chord is dominant in function. In function, it can be it can be triton substitution with added fourth, seventh, and eleventh. It can be secondary dominant of chromatic of altered scale step or something like that. Very very complex, but it's still it's still dominant. You have to hear dominantness of the dominant, subdominance of the subdominant, and tonicity of tone. These are the keys to success. And of course, it's all works with keyboard. Keyboard is not a separate topic, it's this topic. Because you have to be able to play two or three voices, sing one of them, and conduct. That's the trivial requirement. This magnificent system. If restored, will solve so many issues, so many problems. And it's very difficult to conquer all this when you are at, at the conservatory or university, because you have other things to do. While uh, a third grader will not have problems singing, ear training, solfege exercises, and, and doing some uh, um, dictation. Few, few times a week. This system is intended for very slow acquisition. Very slow acquisition. Very, very slow. The same, the same, the same. Thousands of repetitions. 